Hey everyone, welcome to r slash Tales from Tech Support, where we get to have a little chuckle at the technologically disadvantaged, like me. I'm Uncle Reddit, and have I got a story for you. Chili or email, you can't have both. The story happened some years ago to one of my car dealer clients. I had worked with these folks for over 10 years at this point, so little surprised me when issues cropped up. The building they were in was several decades old, and their power needs proved it. One Saturday morning, the wife and I were heading to the big city to do some shopping when I get a call from the dealership. Manager, one of several on hand. Salesperson, no description needed. Me answering the phone. Hello, this is me. Manager, hey me, we're not getting any email and I can't send any either. I can surf the internet, just no email. Oh, and I think the Wi-Fi is down also. Me, well, that's not right. Any power issues? This is an industrial area of the city and the power company liked to perform work on the weekends while it wasn't as busy. Manager. No, power's been good so far. We need to get the email going again. I'm waiting for some important messages from my new car manufacturer that I need yesterday. If we can't send any emails to clients, we could lose sales. It's really important we get this fixed ASAP. Continue more droning on about the importance of his email. Stopping in mid-sentence. Me. Okay, no problem. Wife and I were already heading to nearby shopping destinations, so I'll be there in about 10 minutes. Upon my arrival, I head directly to the server room and find UPS is complaining about being on battery and the email server powered down. Okay, we do have a power issue. Checking the rest of the room, I find the primary dealer management system, DHCP server, parts catalog, routers and switches are all up and running. Wi-Fi controllers and of course the email server are down. I'm checking power feeds when manager pokes his head in and continues to tell me how important email is with several salespeople in behind him complaining about no Wi-Fi. Me. I know. Trying to find out why portions of my racks don't have power. So no power glitches happened after you guys opened? Email is working when you got here? Manager. Yeah, no lights flickered and I was able to access email right away. Then the salespeople started complaining about Wi-Fi. At this point, I'm now headed to the hallway where the electrical panels were located. All five of them, with some of the worst labeling I've ever seen. Decades of labels, marker, crayon of locations that were mostly unreadable. A random salesperson walks up. Hey me, are you looking for the breaker for the lunchroom? <laughs> me. No, some power is out in the server racks and I'm trying to figure out why. Salesperson. Well, if you find the ones for the lunchroom, let me know. The toaster isn't working. Me. Well, okay, but not my priority at the moment. You see, this building used to be a big box hardware store before they got bigger. During the dealership renovation, apparently the electricians did not trace or update the labeling of the electrical circuits in the whole building. Old or new, during the renovation of the building, I did remember seeing the old plans and that the server room and neighboring storage rooms used to be the manager offices for big box hardware. In the fourth panel, I finally found an old label for manager's office and find the tripped breaker. I reset the breaker and turn it back on. And seconds later, it trips again. In the meantime, I hear from down the hall. Salesman. Hey, you found it. Nope, it's off again. What the hell? I go into the lunchroom and find him at the toaster with a bagel inside, and next to it a crockpot full of warm chili. Staff lunches killed portions of the network. As I came to realization that several of the lunchroom receptacles were on the same circuit as parts of the server room some 50 feet away, my level of cursing began to rise. With salesman's help, we moved the crockpot and toaster to the other side of the room, which was still working. I reset the breaker and began to curse the original electricians as I brought the systems back up in the server room. I then retrieved my trusty label maker and labeled the breaker and receptacles, adding warnings to each location just in case. I updated management working that day that their lunch brought down their email, and my wife and I continued our shopping spree, he being pretty irritated at the comedy of errors. Following Monday, I contact general manager and explain what happened. I also let him know that I was making an executive decision that I contacted their electrician and had him add multiple 30 amp circuits to the server room. Always the professionals, they also traced the remaining receptacles in the room and labeled them. To prevent further interruption, I set aside late evening trip on site to move the UPSs over to the new circuits and all was right with the world again. Hope that chili was worth it. Yeah, I guess I can't really blame the salespeople and management too much considering whoever owned the building was the one that had it set up into a dealership and never made sure that everything was marked or traced or rewired or anything. So 
I've run into a few remodels like that on commercial buildings where everything was just one big cluster. Hey, I can't get to the server. This is a short one. Years ago, I was in charge of IT for a medium-sized, roughly 50,000 people municipality. One day, we start getting reports from Village Hall that people can't get to the main file server. My office is our lovely trailer next door, so I walk over to have a look at one of the problem computers. Sure enough, she can't get there. I jump into a command prompt and do some checks and, what the heck, where did this IP come from? The computer had an address from a DHCP server that wasn't ours. After a bit of SHIP, ARP, and SH MAC address table, I found the offending port and disconnected it. Unfortunately, we never had great documentation of where all the ports were, so we had to do some hunting. In relatively short order, I found the culprit. Being a public building, the village hall was used for early voting. With no notice to us, the county sent people in to set up the conference room used for this purpose. Whoever they sent to do the setup plugged in a regular Linksys router to the network jack in the room. I unplugged it, resisted the urge to make it permanently inoperable, and put it in a box with a note to not plug it in again. So, this one, you got a combination of things. Probably another old building that keeps getting retrofitted over and over and over again. Uh, piss poor labeling. And then you got people making up their own decisions as to, you know, throwing routers in in random places. And gotta love that, man. But it sounds like you found it pretty quick. A user let the magic smoke out of the surge protector. Here's a pretty tame one from this morning. The ticket tells me that a user's surge protector has stopped working. They've hit the reset button, but their monitors and PC won't turn on. I walk over to the office to investigate and find the surge protector with burn marks around one of the outlets. There's monitors, a PC, and printer plugged into the other plugs, none of them working. I asked the worker what they had plugged into the last outlet. A space heater. Replaced the surge protector and had a nice discussion about how high voltage appliances need to go directly into the wall, not a surge protector. Luckily, none of the other devices were fried. Happy Friday. Edit. I've been told by a great number of people that voltage is not the correct term. Power draw. I'm tech support, not an electrician. Honestly, I probably would have said the same thing, but I get it. Power draw. Things like uh, space heaters, small air conditioners, refrigerators, anything with a compressor. Yep, all bad things to have on that surge protector. Tales from Y2K Support I've been doing this for too long. I'd started in support at Access Control Vendor a year before. I'd become a senior support person after several of my cohorts had departed. As Y2K approached, our manager set up this plan for New Year's. The entire team would be at the office with the seniors arriving at 3 p.m. to handle flow from global customers, and the juniors arriving at 8 p.m. So 12 of us got our stuff squared away. Some of the guys had brought sleeping bags. We were getting no calls. We had done a three-year effort to weed out the bug, but we were sure not everyone had done their software and firmware upgrade. The phone rang. A staffer at a friendly European defense ministry was doing a check-in to find out if any of their critical defense or infrastructure sites had issues, and to request notification if they did. No calls, we said. Management brought in a ton of food at 8 p.m., and the phone rang every 10 minutes or so with another interrogator or command center asking if any problems had been reported. After dinner, one of the guys announced he had brought Unreal Tournament, and our most senior tech opened some ports. Soon, we were all in our cubes eagerly trying to kill each other while we waited for the sky to fall at midnight. As soon as New Year's came on the East Coast, we had shut the game down and had our plan together for call taking rotation, etc. We were all sure the phone would be off the hook by 12.30 or so. The check-in calls kept coming in, then we got an actual call. The user hadn't upgraded. The old version had a known bug. It would schedule an immediate upgrade, and that was it. As we approached New Year's at each time zone, people would call in asking the status, and then the calls would stop. We played video games for another 8 hours or so, getting paid holiday pay, plus double time and a half for every hour over 8. They sent the juniors home first, then the seniors who wanted to go. By 6 a.m., there were six of us left. A follow-up crew came in at noon. They reported four calls over the next day, all customers who had missed their updates. 
Our last Y2K call came in six months later from a customer who noticed their reports were off. Not only did they need help with the update, but they needed to find their server, <laughs> which a helpful soul had drywalled over the closet it was in. They hadn't done an update in six years. Nothing did uptime like a vax. I don't understand how people drywall over servers, routers, receptacles, breaker panels, plumbing shutoffs, like, you know, your main water supply shutoffs. It's amazing. How do you just cover that crap over without even questioning it? And Y2K, man, everybody flipped over just about nothing. User, it hurts when I do this. Punch yourself in face. Support, well, don't do that. In a previous job, I was responsible for, among other things, a large distributed application, pseudo microservice on the back end, with a heavy user client that had a legacy predating Win32 on a site with a few hundred users. After an update to the system, users began reporting crashes. At first, it seemed to be random, but eventually it appeared to be user specific and would follow them from machine to machine. A few special users in particular made a lot of noise about it, raising hell to their bosses. After due investigation, it became apparent that initiating too many rapid fire key presses would cause a stack underflow and in a particular module of the heavy client. When I say too many rapid presses, I mean that on a mechanical keyboard, the input would sound like machine gun fire. This was obviously a bug in the software in that it was not checking the state of the stack before trying to pop something off it. Since it was reproducible and the logs traced the appropriate section of code to the line, the developers were able to fix it pretty rapidly. However, on a large legacy production system, created when nobody had ever heard of a CI or a DevOps in a 24-7 production environment, patching isn't something that can just be done arbitrarily. It has to be explicitly planned. Clearly it's not ideal, but this constraint is both a consequence of the nature of the business environment and a lack of political will to enforce regular preventive maintenance. Run it into the ground and wonder why it crashes. Hashtag YOLO. Once the root cause was identified, the users were advised, both in person and on an email blast, not to mash their keyboards until a fix was delivered, validated, and deployed. Regardless, the boss of the problem users called my boss and I to the carpet about the issues that were plaguing their team and absolutely preventing any productive work from happening. The sky was falling. The three of us sat at a small table in Angry Boss's office and listened to approximately 10 minutes of ranting. At an appropriate interlude, I interjected that it was in fact a serious issue and I could demonstrate it to see how big a deal it was. I walked over to the Angry Boss's desk, opened the client on their machine, spun the monitor around so it was visible from the table, and then proceeded to demonstrate normal behavior with a reasonable rate of input. I then ratcheted up the input rate bit by bit, with the software still performing normally. It wasn't until I hit the rated approximate force of the GAU-8 Avenger, the Burt gun on the A-10 Warthog, on the keyboard that the software crashed. Any harder and I would have broken the thing in half. The formerly angry boss, now horrified about the thrashing I had just given their keyboard, was silent. My own boss simply smirked, which translated to immense restrained joy and... And schadenfreude? Anybody who speaks German or knows what this thing means, tell me down below, please. I then pointed out that I already had a fix from the developers, but the blocker for deployment was their own production schedule and a lack of cooperation from their team in scheduling the maintenance. The now apologetic boss quickly carved out a maintenance window for us. Later that day, called his subordinate leadership into a meeting and admonished them for over-dramatizing the issue. Whether through lack of reporting or users no longer mashing keys, the issue effectively evaporated between that day and the maintenance window that actually fixed the bug several days later. We also had our IT director replace the angry boss's keyboard for good measure. So a software bug that really only shows up when you mash on your keyboard like an angry toddler having a tantrum. I'm not sure that that's really anything that was your fault to begin with, maybe. But who uses their keyboard like that? I mean, seriously, just abusing the keyboard doesn't make anything work better. It's like my wife at an elevator. She thinks if she just presses that button rapid fire, it's gonna make the thing drop to our floor faster. Doesn't work that way. Hey guys, I appreciate y'all hanging out with me today. If you haven't already, do me a favor. Can you give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, 
and maybe click that little bell icon so you don't miss the fact out with the beard telling you stories. See ya.